On the program tonight, the Prime Minister again assures Canadians that despite growing setbacks, Canadians will get the vaccines his government has promised. That while federal ministers in charge of the vaccine rollout get a grilling at a parliamentary committee. Canada's January job numbers are out and pandemic lockdowns have wiped out all the gains in employment made since last fall. And our journalist panel will discuss what the vaccine woes mean politically for the Trudeau government. But we start with Prime Minister Trudeau, who on Friday sought to reassure Canadians who are increasingly worried about when vaccines will be available after delays by both the Pfizer and the Moderna companies. Now, while he would not answer a question about if there are any penalties in the contracts with the companies for delays or missed shipments, Justin Trudeau said Canadians shouldn't be worried about what he called the noise and the turbulence surrounding the rollout. People are tired of this pandemic. They want to know when this winter is going to be over. They want to know when they can go back to everything they've done before. They want to know mostly when their grandparents are going to be safe, when the vaccines are going to come. That's why there's a lot of anxiety and there's a lot of noise going on right now. That's why I want to reassure Canadians that we are on track. Prime Minister Trudeau speaking from Rideau Cottage in Ottawa on Friday. Now, while the Prime Minister was assuring Canadians that Ottawa's vaccine plans were on track, key federal ministers involved in the rollout of vaccines were being grilled by members of the Commons Health Committee about the delays and uncertainty in deliveries. There was also a question about a report in the Globe and Mail that Canada paid, on average, $38 a dose for vaccines we received in December, and that that's more than either the U.S. or the European Union paid. Here's how Procurement Minister Anita Anand answered that question. We are paying fair value for our vaccines. And we have, as I mentioned, the confidentiality provisions, which uh, prevent me from providing specifics relating to price. Um, but I will say that when I say fair value, that means comparable prices to my knowledge. Of course, I don't know exactly what all other jurisdictions are paying, uh, but we sure. negotiated in earnest for the accelerated delivery, and we will continue to do that with the vaccine suppliers. Joining me now are three MPs from the different parties. Darren Fisher is a Liberal MP and the Parliamentary Secretary to the Minister of Health. John Barlow is a Conservative MP for the Alberta riding of Foothills, and he sits on the Health Committee. And Don Davies is the NDP's health critic and sits on the Health Committee as well. Welcome to all three of you. Nice to be Thanks here. Thanks for having me. Okay, let's start with um, Darren Fisher. So let's start with you on behalf of the government and behalf of the ministers who appeared. Uh, we heard one question, which there wasn't an answer to, and that was about the cost of doses. But the, uh, the other question, which came up again, was from the opposition members, and that was if the government could release not the whole contracts, but just in the contracts with the vaccine companies, the wording concerning, the language concerning deliveries and compliance and timelines. What kind of wording is there. So just an executive summary or a paragraph or two to describe the wording because deliveries become such an issue. Why cannot that be released? Well, I think uh, Minister Anand was very, very clear today that she's uh, sharing whatever she can with Canadians. And I will tell you that, you know, we talked a little bit today in the committee about transparency. And I have to tell you, you know, we have Major General Fortin coming out in front of the public, the Canadian public, every single day, giving numbers. The only country in the world giving numbers on a regular basis to the provinces and territories is Canada. And, uh, you know, from the day one of, uh, from the early days of COVID, we've had, you know, the ministers out in front of the public on a regular basis, you know, talking about uh, the, 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 the things that are good and the things that aren't so good about what's going on in the response, uh, the Canadian response to COVID-19. Right, but, but, I mean, but a, to get to that question, but to the question was specifically, though, and I think it was Michelle Rempel of the Conservatives asked, why can you not tell us, the European Union can tell us that they have a phrase, and that is you'll make your best effort to deliver something for, for such and such a time. Why can't we not even just give a sentence or describe the two or three sentences that describe the compliance uh, what's in the contract about getting these deliveries on time? Well, again, Minister Anand had said, you know, a contract is a contract between two parties and that, uh, you know, remains confidential. And it is a very, very competitive market. This is something that, uh, and she has very much reiterated that she will share what she can share when she can share it. And I, I take her at her word. Uh, some of the, the questions didn't, you know, get answered because some of the 
members of the opposition were uh, speaking over the ministers when they were trying to make ans- uh, answer some of the questions. But uh, what I got from Minister Anand and Minister Haidu today was a total uh, openness to share with Canadians what they can share with Canadians. Okay, John Barlow, uh, in terms of uh, an opposition member of the committee, you had the two ministers, Minister Anand and Minister, Minister Haidu, as well as uh, Major General Danny Fortin before you today. What did you hear that you wanted to hear? What did you not hear? Well, I think what we heard, and I'll um, disagree with Mr. Fisher a little bit, is I know the government is trying to say that they've been very transparent. But what we heard today is that the minister could ask um, some of those pharmaceutical companies to uh, negotiate a release of some portions of their contracts. And what we're asking Minister Nan is to do that, just to have that conversation with Pfizer and, and AstraZeneca and Moderna and and. Uh, so we would have the same access to some of that information of what's in those contracts, just like the United States, the United Kingdom and the EU have done. Uh, so they have a better understanding of what is uh, in those contracts. And I think that's important. Canadians need to know that information and what's uh, what's going to be in those contracts. Are there cash penalties if they do not meet um, their quotas? Uh, and as you said, we, we know that the United Kingdom has much stricter um Regulate or penalties within their agreements with those pharmaceutical companies when it comes to best efforts to deliver uh, on their commitments. We don't know if we have that within our uh, Canadian agreements in those contracts, and we want to know, and Canadians want to know, uh, what are the stringent rules around those contracts, and why did we negotiate delivery on a quarterly basis when it seems every other country has uh, negotiated those on a weekly or even a daily basis. And what impact is that going to have on our ability to access those vaccines? Okay, Don Davies, uh, on behalf of the NDP and on behalf of the questions you asked uh, of the ministers, what did you learn that you wanted to learn or what did you not hear? Well, um, you know, despite the government's... uh repeated claims that they're transparent. The truth is, is that they, there's a lot of room for improvement on that. You know, we have the United States has released the Pfizer and Moderna contracts. The EU uh, asked AstraZeneca if they could release it, and AstraZeneca agreed. Brazil has released an AstraZeneca contract, and uh, we haven't released a single word in a single contract. And uh, so that's disconcerting. And, you know, it's, it's Martin, it's not just an academic exercise. We don't just want to see the contracts for contract sake. We had Major General Danny Fortin today, who who I asked him about his comments yesterday that this this lack of stability in vaccine delivery is creating problems for the provinces and territories in planning their vaccination. And so we 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 need to know basic things like how many doses are coming from who by when. And frankly, if this government negotiated a confidentiality clause that says they can't tell the Canadian public on whose behalf we they negotiated basic details about what we purchased and when we're going to get them, then that's a failure of negotiation. And and finally, what I would just say is, um, you know, I asked about the the Biden administration has uh, established uh, that that the National Guard in the U.S. and federal troops will be brought in to help with vaccinations, because if the government is correct and we're getting millions of doses coming to Canada all at once at the end of March, we're going to have to help provinces and territories, at least some of them, with that vaccination, and I couldn't get an answer out of anybody as to whether or not that was even being contemplated. Okay, Darren Fisher, I want to ask you, uh, on the same topic, but we also saw the Prime Minister today saying to Canadians, don't worry, we will hit our targets. We uh, know that he was speaking with the Premiers yesterday on a conference call, and it was reported by the Premiers that he's concerned that Canadians are losing confidence in in the vaccine program and process. Um, If that's so, why, and you just heard your two opposition colleagues say, there is a possibility of releasing some more information. If we are at, uh, at the mercy of these international pharmaceutical companies, wouldn't it re- really be better for the government as well? If the government could say, look, here we have done the best we can. Here's our contract. And as the prime minister argues, the, here's the commitment they've made. And Canadians can see it. There can be transparency. And that actually might be even easier for your government. Well, it's, it's funny. The prime minister did say today there's a lot of noise out there. And I think the message that Canadians need to know is that by the end of March, there will be 6 million doses in Canada. And by the end of September, everyone who wishes to be vaccinated will be vaccinated. Orders are coming in on a regular basis. Numbers are a little bit lower, but we've, we've mitigated those risks by having contracts with seven different companies. With just Moderna and Pfizer, we will have enough doses by the end of September to vaccinate all the Canadians 
who wish to be vaccinated. That's the message that Canadians need to see and hear. And that is the message that we've been working hard to to get out to Canadians. Another question, I'll just ask you because I know Don Davies asked it in, in, in committee, but you set it up. Uh, if by the end of, if there's going to be enough doses with just Pfizer and Moderna, why is Canada dipping into COVAX? Why are we using the COVAX fund, this international fund for lesser developed, uh, lesser for poorer countries? Why are we using that if, as the ministers have repeatedly said, we're going to have enough uh, vaccines from the people we've already signed contracts with? There are two streams to the COVAX. Canada invested $220 million for the poorer countries and $220 million with which to draw doses for Canada. And that is part of the COVAX plan. And it was part of the plan, and it was announced back, I believe, in November, that Canada would be able to and likely would draw doses of vaccine from COVAX with the $220 million that was intended to do so. Okay, well, on behalf of uh, all of us, I want to thank you for taking the time on a Friday afternoon after a, a late, uh, late sitting of the committee. We will no doubt keep in, in contact and we'll follow this. Thanks for speaking with us. I want to just say thank have you, a good Mark. weekend to all of my uh, colleagues. Okay, good weekend to you all. Thanks, Thanks a lot. Thanks for having us, Martin. Take care. Take care. We turn now to the latest job figures for Canada, and the January figures were not good. Recent COVID-19 shutdowns, especially in Quebec and Ontario, cost the economy almost 213,000 jobs. That's the largest single month's decline since April, during the height of the pandemic and the first wave. Jobs uh, there were, there were, the job losses were almost four times more than predicted by economists. The unemployment rate has increased by 0.6% to 9.4%, and the hardest hit sectors remain retail and travel and the hospitality industries. All this is happening while the country is wrestling with the possibility of reopening, but also with the specter of newer, more infectious variants of the coronavirus. So to discuss it all, I'm joined now by Mikhail Skudarud. He's a specialist in labor economics with the economics department at the University of Waterloo. Mr. Skudarud, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Um, when we look at these figures, first and foremost, to you, a specialist in, in, in labor economics, any surprises and what stands out for you? I, I tend not to try to guess what the numbers are going to be in advance because I don't like being wrong. So I'm, I'm not really surprised. These, these um, data captured the week um, in the middle of January. We know at that time Quebec and Ontario had gone into pretty hard public health measures uh, lockdowns, if you want to call them. Uh, and so we're not, I, I'm not really surprised that we see job losses that aren't nearly as big as we saw in the initial shutdowns back in April and March, but they're, they're, they're big job losses, uh, big, sharp job losses that outside of a, a pandemic are big. Okay, I've alluded to some of the sectors. What, what strikes you about who is still, uh, who, who was affected by this shutdown? Because people are saying it wasn't a complete shutdown, but who was affected and who remains and is still being hurt? So as you said, it, it, it is those sectors that you would expect. It's retail, it's hotels, it's um, bars, restaurants, it's tourism. It, it's a lot of part-time workers, a lot of low-wage workers, hourly paid workers, and younger workers. And, and that's not really that different from what we saw in, in March, April. It's sort of Groundhog Day. I mean, we're sort of going through the same thing we did before. Not as big of, a, of a, an effect, but we're seeing the same kind of, uh, of change in the labor market that we saw in March and April. Is there a sector which has been largely and is still suffering and hasn't really reopened at all? Because uh, some people suggest things like, you know, obviously the cruise industry uh, and some parts of the travel industry, they just have been basically uh, out of luck for the entire duration so far. So it depends, I guess, on how you define sectors. If you, if you define these sectors narrowly enough, there will be sectors, like you said, that, that have, haven't rebounded at all, okay. that, that never fully opened again. And certainly airlines have been hit very, very hard and, and have not, at least in Canada, bounced back, um, are just way, way behind what they were. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure that matters as much as eventually we are going to see these numbers go up. There's no question. Okay. A lot of these losses will be recovered. Um, the question is whether we get back to where we were or where we would have been if we if the pandemic had never happened. Okay, what what are the um, what what are the biggest concerns for you? Because obviously we have this dynamic where we sh shut some things down, and and quite understandably we see job losses. And you're, as you're suggesting, as we reopen, albeit cautiously, albeit partially, we see jobs coming back. But what are the concerns for you? 
So the big concern for me is, is uh, long-term joblessness among people. Uh, we know that the longer you're unemployed for, the, lo the harder it is to get back into the labor market. We've seen a lot of people transitioning to what we call out of the labor force. They leave the labor force, which means they're not searching for jobs anymore. Those are the kinds of changes that worry me because they, they can lead to longer term effects. We, we call it call these kind of ideas hysteresis in, in economics. It's a term borrowed from physics, but the idea is that if you kind of hit an economy with a shock, it doesn't just bounce back to where it was before. It leaves some kind of permanent change in the economy. And, and that's because of a number of factors, but we know recessions, economic crises do that, and that's what worries me. People talk about the active population, that there, there's a certain unemployment rate, but as things like this continue, uh, a lower and lower percentage of people even think of trying to, to go out and, and look for a job. Uh, that may be what you're talking about in terms of permanent unemployment. That's precisely it. So some of it looks kind of voluntary. Older workers, for example, we know when recessions hit, we lose a segment of those older workers. They what about just say, you know, I'm, I'm done with my career. I, you know, I'm going to go into retirement earlier than I would have otherwise. But there's other groups in the population that, that you worry about. Younger workers that are, you know, prime age workers that that um, find other ways to survive, whether that's changing your living arrangements, who you live with, whether that's finding other sources of income that aren't kind of in a traditional paid labor market. These are the kinds of effects that have implications for economic growth, um, that have very you know important long-term effects. Keeping workers engaged in the economy is something that labor economists think a lot about, um, and it's really important. What about, I mean, I'm the, I'm the most obvious one, obviously, is women. I mean, women who are overrepresented in all of these categories, in the retail, in the hospitality industries, in the cultural industries. That's absolutely true. And, and mothers in particular, and mothers with small children. So those are, uh, the reality is, is that in, the, in Canada still today, what women take on that responsibility much more than men. We see that in who takes maternity and parental leaves. Um, and th th there's no question that when these kinds of crises happen, we lose a segment of the labor force because that decision changes about whether or not to, to work and uh, or stay home with a child. Uh, last question and briefly, and I don't know if there's a simple answer to it, but I mean, as we are seeing a reopening, a, a, a careful, cautious reopening, we're also seeing a vigilance about the possibility that we may have to slam the doors shut again uh, with new variants and a possible third or fourth wave. Uh, what do you make of that? Is there any way to reopen safely? And does it inevitably just mean job losses again? That's the million dollar question. You just nailed it. And, and I, you know, what I'm telling people is that I'm an economist and the reality is, is that while this has become an economic crisis, it's a health crisis. And the number one policy prescription here should be health policy and not economic policy. The economy is only following what's happening in the health crisis. If people are sick or people are scared of a virus, people aren't going to work um, and can't work. And, and so keep containing those numbers is all this is really about. It's not about economic policies. This is about containing a virus. And I would say that the, the, the policies, at least in Ontario, where I live, through the fall, were not strategic enough. I think we really need to focus on what the priorities are. I think schools are priorities. I think small businesses, to some extent, are priorities. I don't think indoor sports and gyms and bars are priorities. And I think that's, that's something we need to think very carefully about going forwards now. Okay, great. Thank you very much. We will keep in touch as, as this evolves. It's not over for, for sure. Thanks a lot, Mr. Scudrud. Thanks for having me. I enjoyed that. Joining me now to look at the Trudeau government's response to the pandemic are Tonda McCharles. She's a national political reporter for the Toronto Star. She's joining us from Ottawa. And Negan Sinclair, he's a political columnist and commentator. And he's joining us from Winnipeg. Both of you, welcome. Thanks for having us. Let's start with, um, we've been watching this week and it has been replete with developments, but also replete with problems and vaccine rollout woes. We had the Prime Minister's assurance today, uh, basically assuring Canadians, look, the, the, we are on track. What do you make of where we are today, where the government is today? How much of a problem does the government have on its hands? Or how much is this something that's just going to blow over in a few weeks? Uh, Tonda. Well, look, I think it is a problem for the government. It's definitely being reflected in the polls. Um, we're seeing now a big drop in the government's uh, approval numbers and Trudeau's approval numbers. And I think that, you know, it's an intense time for them. Uh, it doesn't help that they won't reveal 
details of the contracts. They claim that would potentially breach the contracts and limit our doses and compromise future negotiations. So they're kind of caught between a rock and a hard place. It is a very bad time right now not having these injections because you can actually literally count every week we don't have injections by other metrics, case counts, um, people going into the hospital, numbers of deaths. So it's very real. It's very intense for a lot of people. Um, it may well be that the companies will deliver, as promised, these millions of doses before the end of March. Doesn't assuage anyone's uh, worries right now. Maybe we will have a, a separate conversation in a couple of weeks' time, and you know there will be hope. However, for the immediate term, and it's and that immediate term has been now going on for a few weeks, hasn't it? Um, the government is under intense pressure to produce something that is beyond its control, apparently, to produce. Okay, Nigan, uh, your your impression of this? What do you make of it? Yeah, I mean, there's been a uh, well, there's been much news. Uh, there hasn't been much news at the same time, and there's the questions involving the contract uh, linger. Uh, the problem, of course, with sharing a contract publicly is there's a securities issue, and uh, particularly when you're in a kind of struggle to get vaccines with other countries, uh, there's certainly not a precedent, I think, that Trudeau wants to share in terms of sharing with the public the, the various political parameters that take place in these negotiations. But, you know, the, the real challenge is that the communication of this government has really been faltered during this vaccine rollout, where it seems to be pretty simple. It seems to be put up a website, tell people which group will be going when, keep something in a kind of national framework. The problem, of course, is it's, a, it's a several different uh, issues. The first is that the premiers in various different provinces are rolling out at different levels in different ways, and oftentimes at the behest and at the contradiction to the federal government. And then we also have the issue, the massive issue, frankly, of the uh, production of the vaccine, which has now really exposed Canada's reliance on world markets. And, and while, you know, back in the 1970s, uh, Canada produced virtually all of its own vaccines. And here we are in a situation where all of it, globalization and various other factors, corporate commitments have created a, a reliance on international markets. And as we see, particularly, I mean, Europe can't roll it out and the vaccine is produced there. Mm -hmm. I mean, we've got a real big boondoggle issue going all the way back to how many vaccines are in each uh, vial to the point of who's going next and, and a real communication problem with the government that's that just seems to be hampering any efforts and if pe if the vaccines do come in by september as predicted as called for as promised uh then perhaps things will be forgotten but at the moment it looks terrible okay i want to get your reading yeah. on i want to get your reading though on the on the other tr thing and that is the the recourse to the covax vaccine this international consortium producing the vaccine uh canada is now saying that we're going to receive somewhere between 1.9 and 3.2 million doses of vaccine probably an astrazeneca vaccine by the uh, by june um the government makes the case that they have invested canada has invested almost or as much as any other country and that half of the doses under this program were going to go to Canada. Uh, how damaging is it that Canada is availing itself of those doses? Uh, Tonda, you've been following this day to day. Well, sure. Look, uh, legally, Canada has every right to um, claim doses through that facility. Absolutely. They put in millions. They were one of the biggest contributors. 220 million was meant to provide vaccines to Canada. The other 220 million of our contribution was meant to go to developing economies who couldn't afford to. The problem is there's a suspicion in many people's minds that the only reason we're tapping that resource right now is because we can't meet it through our other contracts. So it kind of blows smoke up the whole, uh, you know, we're all here to help every, you know, the rest of the world where we could care as much about them. And, you know, it, it, it kind of looks a little bit greedy on Canada's part since we're such a wealthy company, co country to be bellying up to the bar so early in the game to take those doses. That's the problem. It's not that legally we're not entitled to them. Absolutely. From the get-go, the government said this would be part of its uh, contribution, the expectation we'd get them. But it just doesn't look good. It doesn't look like a humanitarian gesture. Nigan, I have to ask you the same question about COVAX. Uh, what do you make of, of the optics? And, and uh, then I want to get to the other politics in a minute, but just briefly, what do you make of the, the government availing itself of those COVAX vaccines? Yeah, I think that the government's got a real challenge here in that the 
uh, the corporations are saying one thing and also the issues of other countries receiving the vaccine is another thing. Uh, the real challenge here is that the government continues to make promises, but yet doesn't give tangible deliverables or is not able to deliver of what uh, on the street people uh, are interested in. And what while we keep hearing about different vaccines and the ways that it rolls out in communities, we haven't yet heard about uh, the larger sphere about the more macro issues that are at play. Okay, I want to I want to ask the political question now because this is partly why you guys are here, and that is on in pure politics. The latest Abacus poll is suggesting that the government is slipping uh, in terms of its lead, in terms of a choice of electors, uh, popularity, as well as its uh, its approval rating. Uh, Several weeks ago, there was widespread talk around this town about the Liberals and the Liberal government being ready, preparing for, and eyeing a spring election, a snap election, possibly around the budget. How much do you think these events of the last few weeks are changing their, their calculations, Tonda? Oh, there's no question it's changing their calculation. Right now, as one person said to me, they are living and dying on the vaccine rollout. This is, uh, they are not now going to get ready to go into a, a snap election as long as things look so bad for them on the management of the vaccine rollout. Maybe things change in, say, April, May, when if millions of vaccines are uh, rolling into Canada and getting put into people's arms. And so then they are, will have been proven to have managed expectations correctly. Uh, but right now, it's a big problem for them. It goes to confidence. It goes to the ability to not just um, announce uh, plans, but to execute them. And, and that has been a big weakness of this government. Uh, implementation and execution of policies has been a, a vulnerability for them, I'd say. And so I think that some of those calculations are going on right now. Okay, Nigan and Sinclair, your last uh, thoughts on that, on the on election. Yeah, yeah, I agree with Tonda. The, I mean, there's a real desperate situation, I think, for the Liberals, and they're putting all their chips in the middle on this vaccine rollout. The, the Liberals' worst enemy are the Liberals. And what I've said months ago is that the best thing Aaron O'Toole can do is just keep things straight, uh, let the Liberals, the Liberals seem to find their own problems, going all the way back to the We Charity scandal, up to the now the, the communication involving the vaccine rollout. I, I mean, the Liberals really just tend to, to, to create their own issues, going all the way back to the Jody Wilson-Raybould situation. I mean, and, and they also are in really hampered by a situation involving right-wing premiers going from Quebec all the way to the West Coast, uh, whereas people are... are really working in contravention to the government, particularly when it comes to the vaccine rollout and other programs as well. Okay, well, both of you... I think, uh, I, think sorry. I was just going to say the one good thing in those polls going for Justin Trudeau is that Eric, uh, Aaron O'Toole is not taking off either. No, no, they're all sort of uh, stagnant there in terms of popularity. Yeah. I'm not saying personally, but in terms of their numbers, yeah. Well, listen, yeah. all three, of, uh, both of you, Tonda and uh, Nigan, I want to thank you for taking the time. Yeah, Thanks, me have much. a good thank weekend, you, you guys. Well, that's all the time we have for this edition of Primetime Politics from all of us here at CPAC. Thanks for watching and have a great weekend.